So welcome back. I, I think we got off to a great start this morning. I enjoyed the first four papers, actually five if we include uh, Maria's introduction to the overall program of the um, workshops that she's, she and her team with Ian have, have run over the past almost two years now. Quite, quite remarkable. We're going to now look at evaluation in terms uh, in, in visualizations in virtual reality. And I'll make extremely uh, pleased that uh, we have a paper from Daisy Abbott, Kevin Burden, Anastasia Gossetti, Vary Maxwell. I just learned that MH is pronounced in Gaelic as uh, V. I didn't actually know that. I've, even after 12 years in Scotland, I learn something every day. And Stuart Jeffries is going to do the presentation. And particularly, I, I, one of the things that I particularly liked about this particular project was just how well it integrated multiple institutions in its work. And I was really, when I read the abstract, I was really, the, the smoothness of the integration was really quite good. I'm handing, maybe it wasn't that smooth in the process of making it happen, but you're not going to tell us that, I'm no, sure. No. Enjoy, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was, it was wonderfully smooth. Wanted to, <laughs> How's that? Thank okay. Sm very much. Smashing. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to present in this project. This is actually the first time uh, we've presented in this project. It's, uh, it's still running, in actual fact, so uh, when we get to the results, I have to stress they're somewhat preliminary at the moment. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk very briefly about 3D data generation, the context in which this project uh, arose, some of the use and reuse claims that are made versus uh, the reality of those claims, um, I'm going to then talk specifically about the Revisit project, which, was, which obviously is why I'm here today. But again, I'll have to give you a tiny bit of context on uh, the British Empire exhibition, although we have some uh, experts on the British Empire exhibition in the audience, fortunately, if there's any deep questions, project objectives. And then we'll talk about the evaluation uh, methodology that we, we employed uh, and give you uh, an insight into some of the, some of the preliminary results. Uh, as, they, as they currently stand. So first on to uh, uh, the, the kind of material we were looking at. The first thing I have to say actually is we were looking at engagement in, in learning here. We were very specifically looking at learning outside the higher education sector. So uh, the kind of visualizations we're talking about have been around for 20, 25 years. They've been generated in, in research contexts. Here's some examples of them. So these are three-dimensional models there of, uh, of Iron Age beads. These are tiny little things. They'll go down to like five millimeters. There's a, a kind of standard archaeological models now firmly embedded in start archaeological practice and also in community co-production. There's a, a point worth making there uh, about the, the vast increase in the, the amount of 3D content that's being generated both in research, commercial, uh, cultural heritage, but also through co-production community groups. The scale of these, uh, these models varies vastly. This is actually a mid-range scale. So this, was, this, was a, 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 this is a point cloud taken from a laser scan of uh, a site at Proven Hall over in, uh, in Easter House. So these are the, these are the types of projects that, I, that we're talking about. I'm specifically talking about legacy projects as well because none of these were initially <coughs> generated with education in mind. These are the traditional uses. This is kind of why these are being generated. They, they are used in the cultural heritage sector to uh, look at monitoring of erosion, uh, damage to sites over time, how you might manage those sites over time. Uh, they're used a lot in uh, research and analysis. Uh, they're, they're, they're very malleable. They allow you to uh, change the types of visualization, coloring carved stones, all kinds of interesting things. And they're also used for things like recontextualization and the representation of, of, of monuments in use. And there has been a lot of this stuff generated. And uh, some of it exists in digital archives, some of it remains with the institutions, some of it remains with the commercial organizations that have uh, uh, generated it. But when it comes to broader engagement, a, a few things are normally uh, touted. One, is, one of which is virtual tourism. People say, well, it's very useful for generating visitors to a particular site. And actually, 
to a certain extent that is true, but very frequently, as a kind of addendum to the generation of this, these, this content, people say, actually, it will be really useful for education. And that's, we just kind of nod to that, nod along to that. Um, and Daisy Abbott, my colleague uh, who's in the audience, along with, along with Kevin uh, Burton from the University of Hull, in conversations when we, we were thinking about this project, and Daisy was kind of coming up with the ideas behind this project, I think we both acknowledged the fact that having had backgrounds in digital preservation, uh, including digital preservation of 3D content, I, I've just demonstrated, it was amazing how little the stuff was actually being reused. Yeah. It, 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 just for, in academic terms, let alone in terms of education. And education turns up very frequently in uh, statements of potential impact, non-academic audiences, education, education. We were wondering whether, whether that claim that this, these products can be used for education in the future really stood up to any kind of in-depth scrutiny. So there was a project that was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council 10 years ago, which was done by uh, um, what was then the Digital Design Studio at the uh, uh, Glasgow School of Art. And it was looking at uh, a site that no longer exists, a huge site in Bellahouston Park, not very far from here, in the south of the Clyde, which is the site of the 1938 British Empire Exhibition. Um, so these British Empire Exhibitions, there was a number of them that used to run every 15 or 20 years. Uh, and it was an opportunity to bring together pavilions from all the countries around the empire and out with the empire as well, actually. And then have specific thematic uh, pavilions, say, along co the coal industry or the Highland Village, uh, or ironically in the 1938 one, the Peace Pavilion. Uh, because, of course, this, uh, this was a kind of seminal moment, as it were, in, uh, in the British Empire, in that very shortly thereafter, the British Empire essentially no longer existed. Uh, and one of the problems with, the, with the dealing with this in three-dimensional modelling terms was that it no longer exists. The plans were scattered uh, uh, around the world, uh, or sorry, around various different archives, and you, there was nothing to model in existence. It all had to be modelled from uh, contextual data, which did actually include plans. But one of the nice things about this project was that in gathering this material together, we ended up with a really substantial archive of around about six or six and a half thousand digitized objects, which photographs, family photographs, some of the original plans, lots of really nice um, memory work was done in terms of oral histories from people who visited the sites and so on. And there was some early film footage of school, children visiting and recordings of radio broadcasts and so on. So it was really quite rich. So when the AHRC asked for a project that would look back, it was a 10-year anniversary project, when they asked for that project to uh, look back uh, at resources that they would clearly spent quite a lot of money investing in to see what the situation was or impact, for Daisy, uh, who'd already worked in this project in, in, in various terms, and for myself, British Empire Exhibition seemed like a, like a really good opportunity because not only do we have this amazing model, it's a very high quality model, uh, but we also have this additional uh, resource in terms of the, the, the archive. Why don't we see whether what people say about its educational use is actually feasible? And we're interested in kind of two things. One is, technically, what are the problems in going about getting a resource like this and making it available to schools? so they can use it, and also what is the reception of this model by the, by the students and the, and the teachers? Does it help in education? Does it actually make their understanding of the Brinchy exhibition uh, deeper and richer? Does it fulfill that promise, which we kind of, we all have in our mind, oh yes, it'll be useful for education. So, um, we got together a, a, a project, since we have no, at the Glasgow School of Art, we don't have enormous uh, expertise in teaching and learning, the, the research behind teaching and learning. Uh, we have colleagues at the University of Hull, led by Kevin Burton, in the technology enhanced learning uh, uh, aspects of it, fundamental to how the project worked. 
Um, well, we also had a technology partner in uh, UCLA, uh, uh, Lisa Schneider, who developed a software called vSIM, which uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go on and show some uh, uh, demonstrations of. So, uh, briefly, uh, the WeVisit project is, it was a small-scale uh, pilot project. It was funded through the HRC, a special version of the HRC follow-on funding, which focuses on impact, but specifically on projects they funded 10 years ago, which is, it might as well be 500 years ago in terms of digital visualization, I have to say, and this is one of the lessons that we, uh, we discovered. It was a 12-month project, still not finished, finishes in, a, in about 10 days or so, uh, which did raise some interesting questions in terms of uh, uh, scheduling uh, around uh, school terms and school curricula, at what point people were actually learning and what they were learning at various points in the year. Um, we had to engage in model selection, which was pretty straightforward because we, we believed, I think rightly, that the British Empire exhibition was a really good case study for this. We had to look at the software selection and model optimization. And this is, uh, um, this is where some of the technical issues first begin to raise their head. In the, the original British Empire exhibition model was very, very heavy uh, data-rich model, beautifully rendered, and there's some lovely animations of it. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to interact with for, for, for most people uh, on normal, ordinary computers. Uh, there's a, there's a, a kiosk version of it in-house for an art lover over in Bella Houston Park, but beyond that, it's really just sitting on the servers at the, at the GSA. And we needed to find a way of actually making it amenable, making it usable. So we were very fortunate uh, to get in touch with uh, Lisa Snyder at UCL, UCLA, rather, who's developed a, a piece of software called vSIM, which um, in a, this is a, a, a terrible reduction of what it actually is. But we think of it conceptually as kind of like a, a 3D version of PowerPoint, where you have a three-dimensional model, which you, you can, in theory, drop in any three-dimensional model. You can then na navigate that model using kind of standard games controls and then annotate that model either just with text or by adding in richer content. And that was, that was kind of key to the work we were doing because we had all this rich content. We worked with three uh, schools, uh, one primary school uh, in Hull, a secondary school in Hull, and we also worked with Bell Houston Academy uh, in Glasgow because it just seemed really obvious to us that the children in Bell Houston might be interested in the British Empire exhibition since it was on their doorstep. That wasn't necessarily the case, I have to say. <laughs> okay. uh, the project involved quite a lot of, uh, uh, and this, this is a, a kind of a, a very small, much more neutral version of what's already been discussed about engaging with uh, communities. There was, a, there was a lot of requirement for buy-in from teachers, from head teachers. There was a lot of initial meetings. So quite a lot of the start of the project was actually uh, spent in engaging with people just to get them to, to, to buy into the whole idea of the project as well. And that does actually have little implication in terms of evaluate, evaluation, which we'll talk about at the end. We then engaged with software training and content familiarization. So this is so that the, the, the teachers, so that we weren't giving the lesson, the teachers were able to integrate this model into, the, into their lesson. And in practice, the way the project ran was there was a whole series of teaching interventions and they were structured differently from school to school and that again has implications but in essence this is where the teachers were integrating the British Empire exhibition into lots of different uh, teaching uh, platforms so they may have been interested in the history, the history of the architecture quite amazing in terms of the British Empire exhibition they may have been interested in a particular industry for example coal and coal pavilion they may have been interested in uh, uh, the politics and how the world changed from before and after the war. So there was lots of different ways they could be drawn in. They were, in the end, actually drawn into, the model was drawn and used in science classes and art classes as well. Bit of a surprise, but with some very interesting uh, uh, results. And obviously, because although the whole project, from the HRC's perspective, was about uh, increasing impact, actually from our uh, it, it was about addressing some of these research questions about whether or that impact can be created. So really evaluation was, ran throughout the project and was kind of key to the, to the project. So I've talked a little bit about uh, uh, curriculum uh, matching there. Uh, I'm 
there's, a, there's another key point to this, which I think also chimes with some of the comments that were made uh, uh, at the panel at the end of last session, which was a wee bit of a surprise to us, is that initially we had envisaged that what we would do with the British Empire exhibition is that we would produce narratives that would allow you to... I'll just give you an idea. So, so this is the, the cut-down version of the model inside vSIM. This, is, this can all be presented in a, in a kind of virtual environment and it can all be navigated. I'm having to show you still slides here because we don't really have time, but I, I do have a video if people are interested uh, later. So I'm, this is a wonderful VR 3D experience. Here's, here's a picture of it. <laughs> okay, so our, our initial idea was that we would produce these narratives and the uh, children uh, would basically consume those narratives from us. So we would match up stories using the archive, populating the model, with uh, images and video and audio and so on. Uh, immediately, I, at every school, uh, the teachers and people said, no, 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 actually, let us do that. Okay, that's what we want to do. That's how we are going to engage with this. And they were, they were quite clear about this. Don't, don't give us the learning object. Give us the tools. And as children and as teachers, we, we will work and we will create the narratives and we, we will populate them. This is really, really quite important about how this type of content is going to be received in the future. Oh, so that's, so, so the, this, is, this is where you have to imagine how wonderful it is in three dimensions. So, so there's the, the, the north entrance, a little annotation goes on there. And for Tate Tower, you can then link in uh, the images around the Tate Tower and you can add in uh, a voice narrative and, and so on and so forth. And then the, the children actually did do some amazing things in terms of uh, 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 adding content in. Um, some really unexpected things uh, as well, I have to say, is that they were, they, were, they were using, in a music lesson, for example, the children went away and learned how to play music from the 1930s and embedded videos of themselves playing that music from the 1930s inside the, inside the, the, the model. Uh, and also the primary school children uh, went round the model of the site, it's a vast model, and they found a, a play park that we didn't even know existed and uh, spent quite a lot of time going up and down the slides in the play park. Uh, a learning experience. Okay, so our evaluation methodology. We've talked already about uh, the, the, the value of, of having a qualitative research along with quantitative research. And again, I think right, this, this project really uh, um, echoes that. We did do some uh, quantitative research in, in the form of questionnaires and so on. But because there were several different schools and the schools were deploying all these things in different methodologies, plus it wasn't exactly a huge... Um, sample size in terms of the, the, the quantitative uh, method. There's some interesting results and I think we'll, we'll you know, discuss them in, in publications later on, but actually the key to understanding what the project did came from this uh, qualitative approach which uh, it was led by Kevin and Anastasia Gassetti at, uh, at Hull. Ethnographic approaches, so semi-structured interviews, focus group interviews with the, the pupils after the fact, and quite extensive, 30 to 60 minutes. These were again transcribed verbatim and using uh, in vivo, uh, there was kind of uh, quite uh, in-depth thematic analysis of the content. And I think that's, in terms of the most interesting results, it's, it's coming from this qualitative stuff rather than from the, from the uh, quantitative stuff. So here are, are some, a brief indication of some of the, the, the results so far, some of which are surprising to us, but some I think many of you may be familiar with. Uh, the, the first one to mention was, was multimodality. I'm, we are interested in 3D models and the reception of 3D models. Give it to schools, give it to the children, and immediately they start building things in the real world in 3D to integrate. We kind of imagined we might get artworks in response to these posters and they could be embedded. But actually the children uh, were out there physically building models and all kinds of, kind of teamwork exercises. And they were quite keen to actually build digital models and insert them back into the, uh, the, the vSIM model as well. Unfortunately, that, uh, we never actually got round to that. Uh, Cross-curricular adoption, I've mentioned, teacher engagement, absolutely fundamental to this. Uh, and this kind of, there's a, two aspects to this. One is get, getting the teachers to, to buy into it and agreeing that this is a good idea and something they're really interested in. And then figuring out whether that teacher is the one who's going to do it or whether that teacher is the one who's going to tell another teacher they've got to do it, which uh, it caused some issues. Um, the risk aversion, and this, this wasn't 
the same across all schools, but this is a, like a fundamental technology issue which we still face about the dissemination of large-scale uh, large three-dimensional models in any event. In some schools, virtually impossible. It, it, as I said, it varied from school to school, but there, there are schools where it is impossible to load new software unless you get agreement six months in advance, in, in essence. And there are schools where internet access is, is simply verboten. It just doesn't happen. So that caused some, that caused some major problems when, when obviously this is a technology-based project. In terms of the results on, on the content reception, uh, well, these were, these were quite pleasing, I have to say. The, the, the teachers and the students did indeed uh, agree that three-dimensional models do offer an increased power to understand non-existing sites, sites that no longer exist uh, in comparison to books and pictures. Very importantly, I think, it was, well, they're calling it game-like, so a game-like environment. It was a combination of that with the other content that really grabbed our imagination. So not just the model, but the model in association with this other forms of digital content. And really pleasingly, I think, several teachers noted the effect of this type of learning on maturity, emotional intelligence, artistic and cultural intelligence. And mostly this is because it was done as group work. It wasn't done by individuals. It was seen as an opportunity for, for children and teachers to get together and engage in group work. And, and I think that's what the children enjoyed mostly. So. There are many uh, conclusions to this. This is my last slide. This is just a kind of snapshot of some of the conclusions I think are most relevant. There's a few, few other things I, we, we don't have time to go into or we're, we're still working and firming up. That's maybe a better way of putting it. Uh, key one in terms of evaluation. Uh, and I'm sure we're not the only people to have come across this, is that differentiating between reactions to the content that's being delivered and the mode of content are really, really difficult to differentiate. So I'm, I'm interested in, are the three-dimensional models really useful for teaching and learning? Are they changing your perspective to the past? Are they you know, making you feel engaged with the British Empire exhibition? But it's being delivered via a software platform that has its own quirks and its own problems, and when it's being received, there's no differentiation being made by the consumer between those, between how good the software is and how good the content is. It's all seen as one, and it's really quite difficult to unpick those two things. Human factors, uh, I've kind of talked about earlier, risk, time, local conditions, politics, and particularly policy, policy about what kind of content children are allowed to have delivered. Uh, um, student expectations and signposting. This, this one was a wee bit of a surprise to me, maybe reflects my personality more than anything else. <laughs> Students were really results focused. Yeah. So the teacher could buy in, but the teacher had to convince the students that this was really valuable for their education when it came to particular examinations. They were really, really strongly focused on exams and results. Not teachers, children. Uh, so there was, there was, a, a, there was a, a process of signposting required by the teachers to say, this is why this will help you in the future. Finally, final point is just a couple of lessons, I think, uh, from uh, future production and any project in higher education and other cultural heritage sectors where you are going to say this will be useful for education. One is... Contextual information is really important, okay, and it must be structured and there must be good metadata. This project was 10 years old. Hardly any metadata, hardly any paradata. Children were finding it easier to go into Google to find stuff sometimes than they were through the, through the archive, and that's problematic, I have to say. Uh, and finally, final point on this is, is, is really about co-production, about the integration of contextual data with three-dimensional models, but not as a um, as an object to be consumed, but an, an object for students to work with. I think this is a way we can actually start using this material in the future, because there was a real appetite for that, and I think there was real benefit in that. I'll leave it there. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris.